everyone, I'm here with Fern Malice, creator of Fashion Week, host of 92nd Street Y Fashion Icons conversation series and books, uh, president of her own fashion and design consulting firm, better known as the godmother of fashion. <laughs> Welcome, Fern, to Pop Style TV. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, so I wanted to start right away with Fashion Icons book well fashion icons 2 is 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 a continuation of the series that i've been doing um you know we had so i've interviewed so many people at the y and we had 19 in the first book and um all together so far there's been 58 interviews so now we're adding the next 15 to volume two and i'm very very excited about it because this book kind of got put together during covid you know, when I realized the stories that these designers and these um, fashion icons had in their lives were very much a part of what everybody was going through, the ups and the downs and the having to reinvent themselves many times in their careers. And the stories seemed to become more relevant than ever before. And it seemed time to put another book together and share those stories again. I mean, the series is very, very much, who are you? How did you get started in the business? You know, how did you grow up? What was your family like? You know, mm -hmm. people are way more than just a name on a label, you know? And so I don't like to talk to them just about their collections. You know, I wanna to talk to them about literally how, how they become the people they became, you know, and how they built businesses. And many of them are still true to the, what you described in the first go round, many of them still started from scratch and from zero. They weren't all handed over a big empire to take over daddy's business. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, the second book, which as you said, is coming out in May and it's going to be uh, the launch is exclusively at Nordstrom and Nordstrom is doing actually a boxed set that's quite spectacular. We're reissuing book one with updated information about the people since the first interview happened and illustrations that are spectacular by this artist Ruben. Um, artwork is included and so the both books will be in a sleeve that you could buy at Nordstrom's for $125. So that's um, and, and the second book includes people like um, Matt Valentino, Victoria Beckham, um, you know, Rosita and Angela Missoni, Leonard Lauder, Bob Mackey, um, Iris Apfel, uh, Arthur Elgore, the photographer, Tim Gunn, uh, my good friend, Stan Herman, who was president of the CFDA for many years and is uh, a close buddy, uh, Christian Siriano, uh, who's just as hot as they could, they could be, Zandra Rhodes, the British designer. So this book has some international players, which, we didn't really do the first book was very American centric and also Billy Porter, uh, who is just a scream. Always so, so fun. <laughs> so you've been in, in, in the industry for such a long time. You're always very confident. Were you nervous when you, you your first interview was Norma Kamali, right? Correct. Correct. Were you nervous at all or you just went for it? Easily? No, I was absolutely nervous. I'm nervous before all of them a little bit, you know, it's, it's a, off stage till you get a good in, the, nervous. in the hot seat. Yeah, a good nervous. Uh, but with Norma, Norma has been a friend for 40 years. So uh, that's there was a reason for her being the first one. I felt comfortable with Norma. And, you know, we both knew each other so well. Mm -hmm. But I learned a lot from the very first interview because the first one I had all my questions on index cards. And I had I had a little bit too much back information about every award she won and every, and I realized I don't need to, I don't need to do that. You don't need all of that. That doesn't, you don't really learn anything about people just listing all the awards they've won. Um, and it became cumbersome with the note cards. At the very beginning, I was also, I was so concerned about my questions that if somebody went on too long rambling on and on, 
I would cut them off and say, no, 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 don't stop. We're going to get there later. Mm -hmm. And now I'm much more relaxed about that. Let them go, let them talk, you know, and then I will adjust as I go through it and realize, okay, skip those six questions. They answered that 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so you, it's a learning curve. What, what makes a fashion icon? Oh, I think what makes a fashion icon, I think a fa what makes a fashion icon is, is their contribution to the industry, it's their presence, it's their, um, their individual power, their, their way they give back, the way they share their knowledge, uh, the way they treat other people. You know, I don't like doing interviewing fashion icons that are major divas and have a terrible reputation. You know, I don't need to do that. I want to be with people that that I like. Mm -hmm. And I think the fashion icons, the, the, the title gets stretched here and there. But I, I think the word icon in general, I mean, everybody calls somebody an icon. Um, these are people that are have achieved some level of success that is worth acknowledging. And um, is that how the fashion industry uh, got this reputation of having too many divas around or that people are mean girls within the industry? I, I mean, why do you think people have that opinion about a fashion industry? I'm not sure why people have the opinion of the industry being full of divas and um, prima donnas, which it, it does have that reputation. I think it's a self-perpetuating kind of description. And I think the fashion media has a lot to do with that. The fashion media, the way they describe people and create that, those personas. Um, the fashion, fashion is a very easy target to make jokes about and fun about, you know, how silly it is or how irrelevant, irrelevant it is and how this, how that, you know, how, how silly these people look. It's an easy, easy target. But at the end of the day, it's a trillion dollar industry. It's huge. It employs millions and millions of people around the world. Now, the one thing that everybody has to do every day is wear clothing mm -hmm. and get dressed. You don't have to go to the theater. You don't have to go to a movie. You don't have to go to a, a store. You know, you don't have to go to university or to school. You, you, but you do wear clothes every day. So this is a, a critical part of everybody's life and, 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 and just the world we live in. And so you know, I, that's why I've always had great respect for the designers. Even when I was the director of the CFDA, the Council of Fashion Designers of America, it was always championing them as, as, as designers, as craftspeople, as, as talented people making a contribution, working their butts off day and night and, and how hard they work every day in, in and out of every season. You know, if you're an art, if you're a writer or an actor, you could write a great book or do a great movie and then hang your laurels on it and not do another one for 10 years or, you know, take a break and say, I haven't seen any scripts I like. You know, I used to say when I was at CFDA, Calvin Klein can't say, I'm skipping fall. I just don't feel it. You know, you have to do it. You have to keep turning out the goods and, and doing that. And, and I will never forget the time at the CFDA Awards when we gave Johnny Versace an international award and his good friend Elton John presented it to him. Mm -hmm. And Elton John looked out at the whole audience and said, I really applaud you all. You continue to do your thing over and over and every season keep knocking it out and, and you don't have you know a choice to, to walk away from it. And so, I mean, that's how I feel about about the industry and about the, the, the professionals that are in it. Do you think that this is one of the reasons that New York Fashion Week you created was such a success? Because you proved uh, people that aren't part of the industry 
what industry really means, what fashion industry really means for New York City, for the designers, for just economy in general? Well, when I, okay, let's see. What I tried to prove with Fashion Week when I created New York Fashion Week was really, it was really an initiative about convenience and common sense. Before there was an organized fashion week, if there were 50 shows in New York, there were 50 locations and nobody knew who was next, who was uptown, who was downtown. And it was not a big deal in the city. You know, sometimes you'd drive in a cab and you'd see a lot of people on 7th Avenue in front of 557th Avenue. And you didn't know if it was a sample sale or what was going on. You know, once they were organized in the together in the tents in Bryant Park, there's there's safety in numbers. You know, just the just the magnitude of the amount of people showing in one central location gave the whole industry a voice. And I was happy to participate in that voice and to and the world knew Fashion Week was happening in New York. You couldn't miss it. Um, every taxi driver knew if you said, I'm going to Bryant Park, oh, you're going to a fashion show. Mm -hmm. Every student said, oh, I want to be in Bryant Park. It meant that they wanted to have a career in fashion. It didn't mean they wanted to go sit on the lawn. Uh, so that's what organizing the tents did for the industry. It gave it a, a real platform and it became an opportunity for the American designers to level the playing field with Paris and Milan and other world capitals. When you look back now, is there anything you would do differently? If I look back now and think about what I'd do differently, I'd go crazy. <laughs> Every season I would look back and say, we could do this better. Oh, we can make that signage a little clearer. That sign should have been higher. This space was a little too tight. We're always, we're always reinventing and improving on what we did. So uh, there would probably be a list of my long of things I, I could do differently, but I, I'm, I'm happy with how it went. And it was 19, 20 years of a wonderful, wonderful experience in my life and in the entire fashion industry's life. I can't go anywhere now without people saying, oh, please, please bring Brian Park back. Would you? I'm like, no, it's not gonna happen. So it's not gonna happen. <laughs> not gonna happen. What do you Things think about are. New York Fashion Week now? What I think about New York Fashion Week now is um, I'm very, I'm supportive of it. I think that there's great talent still showing in New York. Uh, I think this past Fashion Week felt very good. It felt like we were almost back to whatever the new normal is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think it's a little scattered, clearly. There are venues in Brooklyn and up in Harlem and then down in Wall Street. And you could go a little crazy trying to get around. Um, but the, those are designers expressing their, their vision and they all try to find a venue that expresses that for them and for their collection. So we do make the best of it. But I, I think that the talent is what at the end of the week is what, what rises to the surface and that's what you remember. Do you think they could do better in bringing more editors or more buyers, more, obviously it's difficult to bring international editors in the last two years, but um, do you think that it's maybe lacking uh, more of uh, people from the fashion industry versus uh, influencers, celebrities, or that's just what works currently? What do I, what I think? about the audience now and who they could bring and how they could make that different. It's a different world now. I mean, and at the beginning, you couldn't see, you wouldn't know what was going on unless you were there at the shows. Now, everything is also virtual. Most of the shows are on the, the 360 platform and they're, they're streamed. So it's not necessary to, ne to actually be there in real life. And the audience has completely changed. When I was doing Fashion Week, you would look out at the front rows and you would be able to almost name everybody in the seats. 
and that there's the Sachs group, there's the Nordstrom group, there's the Bergdorf team, there's the Barney's team, there's Vogue and all their people, there's Bazaar, there's Elle, there's, you know, every, all those people. Now you look out and you go, who are they? I mean, I, I have a hard time even recognizing most of those people now. <clears throat> the, way, the way fashion is communicated now is very different. And it, like it or not, it's influencers. I mean, a few years ago, we'd say bloggers. That's, that's almost an ancient right. term now. You know, influencers, TikTokers. I mean, I don't, it's all through social media. That's how we live and breathe. And that's how we, that's how we view everything in the world now through social media. So I, I want to go back to one of your legendary interviews with uh, Bill Cunningham um, that uh, at one point during your interview said that uh, people will soon start fashion, uh, fa start dressing inside their heads. Do you, th I mean, it looks like he was kind of predicting maybe something that's currently metaverse or like fashion metaverse what do you think about that do you think that's that's what he kind of was thinking but it couldn't really name it because it didn't exist <laughs> but what bill's comment was was also that he said look where the look where the kids are are they lining up outside bergdorf's and sacks to get in he said no they're lining up outside apple mm -hmm. you know and so what's in their head is more important than what's on their body is what he was saying. And he was right on the money for that. I mean, it was all about the technology. And this is from a man who doesn't, didn't have a, doesn't have a cell phone, doesn't have a TV, you know, but he's aware of that shift in society of what was happening. You know, did he have a clue about the metaverse? I doubt that, but, but he, but he was on about the technology and that that's, that's what people were interested in way more than clothing. Um, you know, to get the new iPhone when it comes out, you know, as, well, I, I'd say there's also a big rush for the new sneaker when it comes out somewhere and they line up, but nothing like, like the technology. Mm -hmm. And um, Bill was very forward about that. He, he really had a pulse and sense of what was happening. And he, he's right. Absolutely. So what do you think about, um plus size collections and sustainability is fashion moving forward in the right direction. Um, obviously there's probably a lot more to do when it comes to maybe better fitting plus size when it comes to certain designers. Um, do you feel that some of them just sort of jumped on the trend um, and, and how, how do we correct that? My take on plus size um, clothing and sustainability um, is that, in fact, the industry, I think, is now seriously addressing those issues and realizes the importance of it. Designers who are not doing plus sizes are leaving money on the table and it's uh, and they're 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 crazy. It's the it's the biggest growing market in the country. In, in the world. I mean, I think size 14 is, well now 16 is the average size in America, not zero to four or six. Um, designers are, are, are beginning to really pay more attention to that. There are a couple of designers, certainly somebody like Christian Siriano has always stepped up to the plate way at the beginning. And it's really helped his, his career and his business immeasurably. You know, he's taken a stand with the, with the red carpet with every celebrity who can't find a, a sample size in a, yeah. in a showroom to wear. And it's really, really important. Um, I, everybody deserves to have the opportunity to wear beautiful clothing and feel fabulous. Um, I actually just read uh, at the salon this morning, the new Vogue magazine. It's a body issue, the one with Kim Kardashian on the cover. And there's an article, and I'm sorry that I don't remember her name, but she's a Vogue editor, a, young, a woman who is very, very plus size. And, um, and she's just lovely. And she, it's about a four page article about her experience in growing up and loving fashion and wanting you know, fashion and her experience in going to Vogue and getting a job there and 
people not and going to an event as a Vogue editor and the PR people keep looking at the list and they, they almost don't want to let her in because they don't believe that she could be a Vogue editor, mm -hmm. you know, until some superior said, no, let her, that's, that's who she is. You know, so all the stereotypes that come with that are, are, are really unfortunate. And then it's a wet, very beautifully written article. And I think sustainability is also becoming more and more accepted and understood. It's not easy to do it, finding the right fabrics, finding ways to re to remake things without having to use as much water as you use in the industry and, and the way things are packaged and the way things are delivered. And it's such a huge pro project. And it's pathetic that this industry didn't start that 50 years ago. You know, maybe we wouldn't be in this climate crisis that we are now, but but at least it's it's on the table and people are talking about it. And it only will get better if consumers really demand it because it's all about the consumers. At the end, end of the day, they're putting their hand in, the po in their pocket with their credit card mm -hmm. and you know, swiping it or not even having a credit card, just swiping their iPhone. Yeah. And um, you know, if they demand that product, that's what the industry will have to supply. Um, did you ever have any crisis in your career? Was there ever a moment? Because everything seems like so smooth for, for me, an outsider, uh, you know, looking at your career. Did you ever have any ups and downs? Um, let's see. Did I ever have any crisis? Of course, I've had crisis and, and had downs and had <clears throat> moments of reinventing myself, trying to figure out what I want to do next and um, what was the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. Um, I've had I've had a very long career. People think I was just from CFDA and now to my um, role at the 92nd Street Y with the books. <clears throat> I had a long, long career that started at Mademoiselle Magazine when I was out of college uh, to uh, being a fashion director at a department store in New York, Kimball's East, to having my own public relations company for 10 years, uh, to running a big design center in Long Island City in New York. So it's been a lot of different things. And I've been fired from jobs and that I didn't think I deserved to be fired from, you know, and I only bounced back better and, you know, took my three roll Rolodex with me and moved on to the next project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and just kept busy. And I never had a five-year plan. I never said, this is what I'm going to do till I'm this age. And then at this age, I have to do that. And this, I, it's always just evolved. And I believe in doing a good job and doing the best you can do. And, and hopefully the right people around you would recognize that. And, and things progress at an organic pace. It's kind of uh, hard to pinpoint because you've done so much. And um, is there anything you can share with us that um, is left that you'd really like to do next in your career? Well, I mean, I'm going to continue to do Fashion Icons books. We're, we want to start very soon with book three and book four. Uh, there is, in fact, a project that I'm extremely excited about that is in the works and that's um it's taking this series uh that we're doing and making it into a um a streaming series so that people can see each of the designers in their own their own story on one of the many streaming services that happen now mm -hmm. and doing that with um a company called peaceable assembly and the, the producer, executive producers, a man named Jonathan Gray, who did the movie, Diana Vreeland, The Eyes Have to Travel. And he's working with a team and we're putting that together and hopefully we'll be able to announce that at some point soon. Amazing, thank you so much. It was so lovely speaking to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure speaking to you and being part of Pop Style here. Thank you.